He, he's not done with the church. Our best days are yet ahead of us. God is stirring a fire in us. I, I feel like decreeing something right now. I decree revival has already begun in the church, in the true church. In the living church of Jesus Christ, I decree that salvations are going to de- increase over these next several weeks to the point that the church is going to be full of new converts. The sick bodies are going to be healed. That everybody that walks through those doors are going to find healing in the name of Jesus. And the fire of the Holy Spirit is going to burn in the house of God once again like it did in former revival. Bibles. Don't be surprised, church, if Cashtown Fire Company and Buchanan Valley and Gettysburg don't show up in the parking lot one of these Sunday mornings or Sunday nights when the neighbors are going to call and they're going to say, Jesus is Lord, church is on fire. But I'm telling you, church, I, I, I feel the fire here tonight. And I, 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 I've been sensing something all week as I was preparing. I ministered this morning. I knew I was preaching in the morning and the evening on the day of Pentecost when we celebrate Pentecost. And I knew that I was going to be preaching and what the Lord began to say, tell the people not to wait till you get to the end of the message to experience my fire. And I, I, I want to say this to you, anytime I'm preaching, anytime I'm ministering, if you feel an unction of the Spirit to get out of your seat and come up to these altars, if you feel like there's something in your life that you need to lay down, lay it down. Lay it down. Get rid of anything that would hinder you from becoming the man or the woman that God has called you to be. Every one of you sitting in here tonight have a call of God upon your life. It may not be to be a pastor. It may not be to be what we call an evangelist. But you're all ministers of the Lord in some aspect that God has given you a a ministry of anointing of the Holy Spirit to fill a void in the body of Christ and to touch the hearts of people. Church, revival is here. Revival is here. It's in you and I tonight. It's in us. I feel fired up tonight. I feel the fire of God. I feel the presence of God. I feel like old Jeremiah did. There's like a fire. It's been shut up in my bones for long enough. And, and I cannot be silent anymore. I cannot be quiet anymore. You know, I feel this way. If the enemy can spout off out there and spew his stuff out, it's time for the church to spew the Word of God out. It's time to speak life and hope into the lives of people that are being destroyed by the powers of darkness tonight. I say to you, church, enough is enough. I hear God saying it from the throne room of heaven To us, enough is enough. It's time we silence the enemy with the voice of God. You know, shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Shout unto God with the voice of praise. With praise. Praise Him tonight. Worship Him. Today's Pentecost Sunday. It's Pentecost. You know, I, I, I said it back in the prayer room tonight. Pentecost was not a once and done. You know, Independence Day was not a once and done day. We're still living in the independence that others bought and paid for. But when the Holy Spirit came into that upper room on that morning, early morning of the day of Pentecost, He came, the Bible says, and remained. That same Holy Spirit that moved like a rushing mighty wind into that upper room is still moving like a mighty wind and fire into the church tonight. Many of the churches whose doors are shut and whose lights are out tonight, God wants those doors opened again. God wants the lights turned back on. And God wants the fire of His Holy Spirit to burn within His bride once again. You that are watching online tonight, God wants you to have that fire in your living room. And I would say this to you, when the fire comes, it's time to get out of your living room and find yourself a church to get into that's preaching the Word of God where the power of 
and the Spirit of God is moving once again. We're going to see miracles, church, like we've never seen before. We're going to see transformations in the body of Christ like we've never seen before. God never meant for His church to be sick or ill or weak. We've settled for less. We've settled for less. But I'm telling you, this revival that's begun is going to re fire the church. There's a resuscitation taking place. You know, I, I've been through first aid courses. They've taught us how to do uh, a lot of the resuscitating when somebody has quit breathing and how to, to get them started again, how to get that heart beating again. God wants to get the heartbeat of the church going again. God wants to put breath back into us like he did on the day of Pentecost. I want to read a couple. I don't normally do this, but I want to read a couple excerpts out of a book by John Kilpatrick. Most of you know who John Kilpatrick was. He was the pastor over the Brownsville Revival several years ago that for several years it touched uh, thousands upon thousands of people. People come from other nations to that city in Pensacola to experience revival you know, but after a few years, it ended. It burned out. But I'm telling you what I'm feeling in my spirit tonight, church. The revival that is beginning right now is not going to burn out this time. It's not going to wane anymore. This is going to be a last day revival and an awakening that God is bringing to the bride of Christ. I'm ramping myself up right now. I'm saying, Lord, give me strength. Give me endurance. Give me boldness in this hour. That if I, I, if I, got, if, if I preach and fall over dead in the pulpit, don't worry about me. Just let me go. But I know there's some of you who want to lay hands on me and bring me back again. But I'm telling you, God is putting a fire back in the spirit of men and women of God tonight. If your fire is burned down, if all there is is some warm coals there, ask the Lord tonight. Say, Lord, breathe on those coals tonight. You know, I used to help start fires too, Pastor Mike. I used to use gas too, but there's times I didn't have gas and you had to do whatever you had available. And there's times I had to get down on my hands and knees and, and just begin to blow on the embers that were there. And you know what God is saying? Get down on your hands and knees tonight and begin to cry out to me for my breath to blow on those embers in your heart and your life. That a fire, those embers, when they're blowed on the fire, the flame will begin to burn once again. We're going to talk about the fire of God. God. Revival fire. Revival glory tonight. But let me read this to you. This, in this book, he wrote some, some writings of other leaders. Many of you have heard of Leonard Ravenhill. Leonard Ravenhill said, as long as we are content to live without revival, we will. If we're content to live it without it, we will. Many in the body of Christ, many churches tonight have chosen to live without revival. They just want church as usual. But the problem of it is, it's a church without power. There's a, it's a church without the evidence of the presence of God in those churches tonight. He also said, at God's counter, at His counter, there are no sales days. For the price of revival is ever the same. Travail. Prayer. Prayer. It was prayer that birthed revival. It was prayer that was happening for 10 days before Pentecost came. The Bible says they were in one place in one accord. They were praying for 10 days. You know, it's hard to get people to pray for 10 minutes, let alone 10 days anymore. But they began to pray. The Lord had given them a command before he ascended into heaven. He said, go and tarry. Go and wait. Go and pray. In Jerusalem until until the Holy Spirit comes friend if they needed the Holy Spirit in that day to preach the gospel how much more do we need the Holy Spirit and power to preach the gospel in this hour I don't want to preach a dumbed down watered down gospel to anybody I don't want to preach a gospel that just makes them feel good but I want to preach a gospel tonight that will transform their life that they will know who God is they will know the power of God they will experience the power of God in their life. That's what God wants to do in His church tonight. Let me read on here a couple of these other ones. William Booth. How many of you know who he is? William Booth said, you must pray with all of your might. 
That does not mean saying your prayers or sitting, gazing about in the church or chapel with eyes wide open while someone else says them for you. It means fervent, effectual, untiring wrestling with God. How many of you have been wrestling with God? I don't think we know. That, that's a lost art. How many of you remember the story of Jacob? Jacob wrestled with God. I don't know how many hours he wrestled with the angel of the Lord, but he wrestled. And daybreak was coming, and the angel of the Lord said to him, You've got to let me go. You've got to let me go. Daybreak is coming. I need to go. And you know what Jacob said? And I pray it's your prayer and your cry tonight. I will not let you go until you bless me. You know, if we had that kind of a fortitude tonight when we pray that, God, I'm going to keep bugging you. I'm going to keep praying until you bless me. How many of you want blessed tonight? How many of you want the power of God to move? I pray that while I'm preaching tonight, that you're feeling the power and the presence of God that is stirring this atmosphere. God is stirring and troubling the atmosphere tonight in the atmosphere within the four walls of churches. God wants His presence to be felt. God is not just a story in a book. It's not a fairy tale tonight. What I'm preaching to you is real. What happened on the day of Pentecost is real. I can only imagine what it might have been like, but I'm going to tell you what God is getting ready to do. Some of those that were in that upper room would desire to be where you and I are tonight, getting ready for the next wave, the next outpouring of the Holy Spirit and fire. John Kilpatrick wrote these words. He said, we need to seize the moment that we have been given. In these days of deep darkness and moral compromise, the body of Christ cannot afford to remain a sleeping giant. While society as a whole and even pockets of Christianity are embracing sin, they're embracing sin. Do you hear that? As acceptable. The church is abandoning the power of Pentecost. The very dynamic that set us apart to begin with is what many have considered unpopular, controversial, and divisive. How sad. How sad. He went on to say here, God is the only one capable of breaking into a human heart and setting it ablaze with holy zeal. He alone demolishes strongholds, cancels curses, overcomes impossibilities, breaks addictions, heals sick bodies, and delivers tormented souls. Friend, we live in a sick world tonight. There's sick people all around you. You bypass them in the supermarket aisle. You walk by them on the work sites people that are sick in their soul and in their spirit that God has put there in your path to minister to them. And I pray that the fire of God that got upon that 120 that I feel here tonight will get in your spirit that you will no longer walk by them. I, was, I went for a, a testing the other day and as soon as the young lady got behind the calendar, she was quick to tell me, I've had a rough morning. I woke up and I got a migraine headache. And I said, well, I'm going to be praying for you that God will heal you of that. You know that sometimes that's all it takes. That's all it takes is to speak a word of God over them. Don't walk by them. They may be the next miracle that God uses you to perform in their life. One final comment here that John Kilpatrick made. He said the Brownsville revival was not the result of preaching it was God's sovereignty colliding with humankind's desperate cry in the place of prayer. In my personal experience, prayer was one of the key factors that paved the way for this extraordinary move of the Holy Spirit. Thank God for a church that prays tonight. Thank you, Pastor Mike, for opening the doors to this house that we can have prayer on Sunday and on Monday night and who knows how many other times that we're going to gather in the days ahead to pray. Friend, before we move, we better pray. Before we act, we better pray. We better know what the will of God is. We better be asking God to put the right words in our mouth and not to go on our own unction and our own power. Friend, we're limited in what we can do within ourselves. But friend, there is no limitation 
on the power and the presence of God. If it was that important for those disciples before they went out to minister to have the Holy Spirit come, it's even more important to you and I. I'll keep repeating that till you get it. Till you realize how important. You know, I've, I've heard so much criticism over the years about the Holy Spirit, about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, about speaking in tongues. And friend, I am not ashamed of being Pentecostal. I am not ashamed tonight to be, tell you that I am filled with the Holy Spirit and that I speak in other tongues and other languages. It's my strength tonight. It's my helper. It's my comforter that lives within me. He is a person. Holy Spirit is not a thing tonight. He is a person. He is the third person of the Trinity tonight that has been sent to you and I. And I thank God that Pentecost is alive and well tonight. The move of the Spirit in this earth is alive and well tonight. And I'm going to tell you, I serve notice to the enemy tonight that you're about to feel the power of God. You're about to feel the wrath of God that's going to come down upon the enemy and the works of darkness once again. You know what? I, I, again, I'm not boasting on it, but I've had to pay a price for where I am tonight. I've had people come to me and say, Pastor Gary, I want what you got. I want what you got. And, and my only comment to him is, are you willing to pay? Are you willing to pay the price? I could tell you, I, I, Pastor Mike, I, I, I'm like you. I could tell you stories tonight. I could tell you stories of the heartache and the heartbreak that I've been through because of my profession of faith in Jesus Christ. Every time I get ready to do something, even this week I've felt the enemy wanting to come against me because he knew I was preaching on Pentecost. He knew I was preaching on the power and the presence of God. The enemy doesn't like it. I can tell you what he's doing right now while I'm preaching. He's holding his hands over his ears so he doesn't have to hear it. Well, that's too bad. He don't have to hear it. I'm still going to preach it because there's other ears that are open to hear the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You shall know the truth, the Bible says, and the truth will set you free. There's a lot of people bound tonight, church, but we have the truth of God, and God is calling you and I to rise up and to do our part to see them set free tonight. Revival fire, revival glory. E.M. Bound said, every mighty move of the Spirit of God has its source, its beginning in the prayer room. Every move of God. You can't preach people into revival. You can't teach people into revival. You can't program into re people into revival. The key to revival is, is and has always been effectual, fervent prayer, seeking the power and the presence of God. I believe that the preaching is part of the fruit of that praying. I, I couldn't preach if it wasn't for prayer. If it wasn't for the prayer of many that pray for me, that pray for Pastor Mike when he gets behind his pulpit, it's a result of prayer. And I'll tell you what, the more prayer that's going up, the stronger the message is going to get. Yes, amen. I, I know you think I'm preaching strong tonight. Well, you just keep praying for me a little more, and I'll show you how strong the anointing can get. And, and the same anointing that I feel upon me, God wants to place upon you tonight. That you can preach the word with authority and with power tonight. That's what he wants his word to go forth with power and authority and with demonstration. When we pray for, when you pray, let me put it this way. When you pray for people for healing, do you believe they're going to get healed? Do you see them being healed? When you pray for people that are bound with demonic spirits, do you see them being set free? That's what faith is. Without faith, the Bible says, it's impossible to please God. But when we believe what His Word says, and when we do what His Word says, He will perform it. I was speaking to some folks this week. I said the problem with, with many people nowadays is that they're afraid to step out because they're, they're fearful that what they're praying God won't do. You know what I tell them? The results don't belong to you. All God is asking you to do is pray, have faith, believe, and pray. And He will do it. But you've got to give Him the opportunity. It may not happen at that moment. But you continue to believe. You pray through. We've got too many people that quit before the answer comes. Pray through. Don't just ask, but keep on asking. Keep seeking. And if, you, if, if, if not, keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. What I found is that if we will be faithful on our end, God will be faithful on His end tonight. I said, God, send the fire. 
Revival is when God does what only God can do. I can't make revival happen. I can get emotional. I can jump up and down. I can run around here. But friend, if all it is is the flesh, then all I'm going to do is get tired. And you're going to be tired of me doing it. But when God is in it, when the anointing is upon our, our worship, when the anointing is upon our shout, when the anointing is upon our dance, and whatever we do, it has a voice in it that will speak to the heart of those that are in a place of bondage that are struggling, and it will rescue them out of that place. The fire of God tonight, revival fire, revival glory, revival fire. You know, the fire must come before the glory comes. Because you know what the fire does? The fire refines. The fire purifies so the glory can find a place of habitation in our life. God will not put His glory and His presence in an unclean vessel. But the fire of God. And that's what this message is about tonight. The fire of God, first of all. I'm going to look at fire tonight. Number one, fire is fervent. Fire is very hot. You that have been burned, you know how hot it is. But I'm telling you, the fire of God is hot. It's fervent. It's passionate. The fire of God is radiant. It's radiant. It glows. How many of you have ever taken a piece of metal and putting it in the fire and you keep it in there till all of a sudden it begins to glow? That even when you take it away from the fire, it's still got a glow to it. But how many of you know if you remove it from the fire too long, the glow goes out? I believe that's a message to you and I tonight. Stay in the fire. Keep your vessel in the fire of God's presence. Hebrews 12, 29 says that our God, our God is a consuming fire. His fire is a fervent fire. I thank God for the cleansing fire of God that's touched my own heart. I love what it says in Matthew 3, 11. It was the words of John the Baptist when he saw Jesus coming. And he said, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. But he said, he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He will baptize you. And it wasn't too long after that until Pentecost came. And that holy fire, he baptized them with that holy fire of God. His fire will transform a life and remove it from mediocrity. There's too many mediocre Christians. There's too many that are living what I would call a convenient Christian life. They're okay as long as the pressure isn't on them. But when the pressure comes, they fold under the pressure of the oppress oppressor, the enemy. But God is raising up a church tonight. God is raising up a remnant that will not bow to the works of darkness, that will not give in to it. I want you to think about something this evening when I talk about fire, when I talk about Pentecost. How many of you, I would encourage you to read the early chapters. In fact, read all of the book of Acts. But I'm telling you, what we see in there, especially in those early chapters of the book of Acts, we are seeing it happen all over again today. We're seeing those that are telling the church to be quiet. Don't preach in that name, the name of Jesus. Close it down. That's what the devil is trying to do right now to the church in America. Close it down. Close your doors. The sad part is too many have listened to it. Too many have become victims of the voice of the enemy. I'm not here, listen to me, I'm not here to tell you tonight that COVID isn't a real disease. I'm not here to tell you any of that. But friend... When these things happen, more than ever before, the church ought to be a prominent place where people can come and be healed and set free. 
I believe that the church is the answer for what America is facing tonight in every aspect, whether it's political or physical or emotional or whatever it is. I believe the church is the answer. I believe the government of the kingdom of God is the answer. I believe the healing power of Jesus Christ is the answer to COVID tonight. Everybody's proclaiming vaccines and, and all this and that. Friend, my God is still a healing God tonight. By His stripes, we are healed. Friend, think about it tonight. I, I ask you, I, I've been asking people this question. You know, you want to talk faith? Just tell me tonight, is, is vi this, this virus bigger than your God? Is God not able to heal? Is God not able to set us free? I don't care if it's COVID or whatever it is. Friend, when COVID's done, there'll be something else that the, the enemy is going to use to quiet the church and shut the church down. I say, not on my watch. Not on my watch. If, there, if there's anything I can do about it, I'm going to preach the Word. I'm going to preach the truth of God. That my God saves, my God heals, my God delivers, and my God provides. He always has and He always will. There's some things that are unchangeable. I serve an unchanging God tonight that can do whatever I can believe Him to do. In fact, His Word says that He would do even exceedingly abundantly more than what I can ask or think. That's who my God is tonight. We got to get that in our spirit. And sometimes we got to convince ourselves. I got to convince Gary Schaefer sometimes that God is bigger than that problem that I'm facing in my life. God is bigger than any government. I don't care who it is. God is greater than any king of this earth. The Bible, my Bible tells me he's the king of kings. My Bible tells me He's the Lord of Lords. And I read it, and I said it before, with God nothing is impossible. Whatever I need, He can provide it tonight. He is well able. But it, the fire of God is fervent tonight. Those uh, two men on the road to Emmaus didn't realize along that journey that they were actually fellowshipping with Jesus until He took and broke bread. And when he broke bread, the Bible says their eyes were open. And you know what their words were said? Oh, didn't our hearts burn within us when he spoke? Oh, that our hearts would burn within us when the word of God is spoken into us once again. Amen, church. Come on. Amen. Not only is the fire fervent, the, the eye in fire stands for intensity. The fire of God is intense. When the fire of God gets in you, it stirs something inside of you. It awakens something within you and I. Intensity means it existing in an extreme degree, marked by great zeal and energy and eagerness. How many of you have felt an infusion of the energy and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life recently? How many of you have felt a resurgence, a rekindling of that fire, the intensity of the fire of God in your spirit tonight? I don't believe we can help but voice what God is voicing in us. I don't believe we can stay silent when the intensity of the Holy Spirit begins to burn with us. And I say, God, release your fire tonight. Release it right now. Release it through the airways from the satellites, God. Shoot it up into the atmosphere and off of those satellites into homes where people are watching tonight that you begin to feel. Some of you, I, I believe right now, some of you are beginning to feel your temperature. It feels like your temperature is rising. You're beginning to sweat because the fire of the presence of God is beginning to burn in your spirit. And God is creating a hunger in you for more and more of Him. I said it earlier, Jeremiah said, it's like a fire shut up in my bones. A fire of God. You know what it says in, in, in Acts 2, 1, it says, And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were in one place, in one accord, and suddenly there came a sound. A sound that came where? Where did it come from? Where did the Bible say it come? It come from heaven. It come from heaven. It was God. It was God, I believe God just kind of leaned over and went with his breath into that upper room. And there was fire in his breath. And it was the Holy Spirit that was in his breath. You know, read the accounts of who the Holy Spirit is and those things that represent the Holy Spirit. One of the greatest things is fire. 
It's wind. It's all those things. Those things that we call emotions is really the Holy Spirit. When we feel that rush within us, we, when we feel that power, that resurgence within us, it's the Spirit of God in us. It's not an emotion, it's a person in you that's stirring something up inside of you. God wants you to get stirred up tonight. Come on, church. You know, D, you, you, you know, sometimes we got to try and encourage the people. You know, get a little emotional. Shout a little bit. It might do you good. I preached a message here not long ago about restoring the roar back into the bride of Christ. You know, when we begin to roar, that spirit of timidity begins to break off of us. And a spirit of boldness comes upon us. We get that lion spirit. L-I-O-N, not L Y. I or E N or I N or whatever it is, however you spell that other. But it's the spirit of the lion of Judah that gets in us. It's in us. It's in you, Dan. The spirit of the lion's in you. It's in you, Charles. It's in you, D. It's in you, Leah. I could go around every one of you, that spirit of the lion of Judah, just waiting to be released. My only question to you is what's holding you back? What's keeping you from it? You know, I'll tell you one thing. When those 120 come out of that upper room, they weren't the same people they were when they went in. I, I tell you what, I believe when, that, when the Holy Spirit came, I believe when that wind came and those tongues of fire came, it wasn't quiet. You want to know why I know it wasn't quiet? They were in an upper room. They were in the second floor of a building. And people out in the street heard their language being spoken. I believe there was a, a, an increase of the volume in their voices as the Holy Spirit continued to move upon them. I don't know how long they may have spent in that upper room after the Holy Spirit came until they went down in the street. You know, I, I believe it was more than just five minutes. It could have been a couple hours. I don't know. But I know the Bible tells me when they come down out of the upper room, it was the early hours of the morning, and there were people out in the street that would be, you know, right away, Right away when the Holy Spirit came, the criticism came. Oh, don't pay no mind to them. They're just a bunch of drunks. Yeah, what did Peter say? They're drunk all right. They're drunk on a new wine. He said, this is that that the prophet Joel spoke about. That in the last days, God would pour His Spirit out upon all flesh. This is that, church. What I'm preaching to you tonight is that. That same Spirit that came in the upper room. There is only one Holy Spirit. And that same Spirit is in you and I tonight. If you've already been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you've got it. If you're born again, you've got the Spirit, but you, some of you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's another level of the anointing of the Holy Spirit that God wants to pour in you. I, I know when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes in at that point to live in your life, but then God wants to give you that exceptional anointing of the baptism of the Holy Spirit so you can do great and mighty things for Him. And that's the fire, the intensity of the Holy Spirit. The intensity, the fire, the R in fire speaks of relentlessness. The Holy Spirit, God is relentless tonight in His pursuit of you. And we need to be relentless in our pursuit of Him. We, we need, uh, don't be a pushover, but be relentless. Press in. Press into the presence of God tonight. Pray like you've never prayed before. Worship like you've never worshiped before. That's why I love worship, D. I love to worship God. I, I do a lot of that, even in my, my time around home now. There's times that if you get close to my house, you'll hear the music playing out on the back deck. I, I get worship music on. I put it on my phone, and I got this little speaker now that boots a volume up. I, I, I want to hear it. I, I want to hear it. I want to feel it. I, I want to feel the presence of God as I begin to worship with those that are singing. And you know, I, I've, I've worshipped myself out of some valleys. A lot of times I've worshipped myself out of the valley that I found myself in. And, and you might say, well, you're a pastor. You shouldn't get in the valley. I, I got news for you. When you get into to levels of leadership, you get into a lot of valleys. You face a lot of valleys. But you know what? I don't choose to stay there. I'm not a valley dweller. I'm a mountain dweller. I'm a mountain person. 
I like to dwell in the mountain. I like to dwell in Zion. We sang about Zion tonight. Out of Zion, out of Zion comes the glory of the Lord. And I love being on the mountain of the Lord. Thank God for the valleys, but thank God for the mountain tonight too. And the intensity of the joy of the Lord. God is relentless. A relentless pursuit on our part is what it's going to take. It's not a time, church. Listen to me. I'm going to use some of the termination that the world's using right now. It's not a time to social distance. It's not a time to keep God at arm's length and six feet away. It's time to dive into his presence. It's time to get closer to him than we've ever gotten before. So excuse me, CDC. Excuse me, Dr. Fauci and things. You know, I might sound critical, but maybe I am a little bit. Because I'm kind of fed up with people telling me I can't be close to my family. That I can't be close to my friends. Friend, that is a tool of the devil if there ever was one. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Draw close especially to the Lord in this hour. Use common sense, but use wisdom too. It's not a time to run from God. It's not a time to avoid the presence of God and the fellowship with the people of God tonight. But it's a time, church. This is what they're afraid of. They're afraid the church is going to come together. They're afraid that there's going to be another gathering in the upper room and the power of God's going to come and quelch what they want to do in this hour. But I'm telling you, it's time for the church to arise. It's time to rebuild the altar. It's time to rebuild the altar in the church. That altar in this church wasn't built to make the church pretty. It was built for a purpose that people can come and lay their life on the altar. It's time to rebuild the altar. Baal has spoken long enough. The prophets of Baal have spoken long enough. Take it for what it's worth. I'll not expound on that. But I will talk about the story of Elijah in the book of 1 Kings. You know, God will raise up a person at a certain time for a certain reason. God raised up a man to face 450 men. God raised up a man that said, I've had enough. Church, have you had enough? You know, Elijah was a smart man because he had the wisdom of God. You know, I, I love it. You know, everybody wants to go first. So that's what he told the prophets of Baal. Go ahead. Have at it. Build the altar. Put the, build the altar. Get your sacrifice. But, he said, don't one of you light the fire. Don't bring false fire to this meeting. Call on your God. And you know, the Bible said that they prayed, they cut themselves, they shouted, they danced. They, uh, from what I can gather, from what I read in the Word of God, they literally destroyed the altar that they were c trying to call fire down on. You know how I know that? Because when it was Elijah's turn, it said it was about the hour of prayer in that evening prayer that Elijah kind of stepped up and said, Okay, enough is enough. I can almost hear him saying that to the prophets of Baal. You've had your chance. Now, step aside, if you would, please, and give me an opportunity. And Elijah began to speak to the people because, you know, a lot of those that were deceived were his own countrymen, the people of Israel. They began to worship the prophets of Baal. They began to listen to a false voice. Now, Elijah said, now, folks, I'm not going to do it for you, but rebuild the altar. Put it back together again. Gather the wood and put it on the altar. Get the bull, kill the bull, and put the bull, put the sacrifice on the altar. And they dug a trench around that altar, and then he said, Now, I want you to pour water on the offering, and on that altar, and on that wood. Now, does that make a lot of sense? You want to burn something, and you're going to pour water on it before you start it. You know, there's a lot of things God will do that do not, does not make sense to the natural mind. But he didn't only tell them to put water on it once. He told them to put water on it again. 
And in that day, listen to me, church, it hadn't rained for three and a half years. Water was a hot commodity. There wasn't a lot of it. But you know what God told the man of God to do? Put on what you have the least of, what you need the most. Put it on the altar. And a third time. Until it says that the trench, not only was the, the altar and the wood and everything soaked, but the ditches were full of water. And I love what the Scripture says. And he said, at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet approached the altar and he said, he walked up to that altar and he began, and I believe he looked heavenward. And he said, O Lord, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me so that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back to you. That's what he prayed. That's all he prayed. And the word here in verse 38 of 1 Kings 18 says, Then, when did it come? Then the fire came after they rebuilt the altar and after they put the sacrifice on the altar. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering, the wood and even the stone and the dust, and it lapped up the water that was in the trenches. And when the people saw it, they fell face downward, it said. They fell on their face and they said, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Friend, we're about to see the fire because there's a lot of altars that are being restored tonight. A lot of personal altars as well as corporate order, altars. I believe the altars of the church are going to begin to be used once again. And not for decoration, but for prayer. Where people are going to come and fall on their face and cry out to God for the mercy of God to come once again. And when they cry out, church, the fire of God is going to fall one more time upon them. And my final point, I need to get to it quickly. The E in fire stands for extraordinary. Extraordinary means notably unusual and exceptional things that God is about to do in your life and through your life in this hour. It's being employed in a special service as an ambassador for the Lord, a carrier of the fire, causing the flames to spread in a supernatural manifestation of the Holy Spirit, causing signs and wonders and miracles to be the result of that prayer. Fire carriers... How many of you want to be a fire carrier tonight? How many of you want to do extraordinary things? Amen. Friend, for too long, we've... I don't know how I want to say it tonight. For too long, we have never felt like we were qualified. For too long, we never felt like we were called to do those things. Only the pastor, only those that have a, a, a title before their name can do that. But friend, the Bible says that, that God has, has moved upon His people in this hour to do a mighty work in us and through us like never before. That His ministers, His ministers shall be called ministers of fire. Ministers that carry the fire of God. Every one of you are a minister of God. Every one of you have a testimony that needs to be heard, that needs to be proclaimed. The fire of God, the Holy Spirit, wants to move in us. Joel chapter 2, it says, And you shall know without any doubt that I am in the midst of Israel to protect Israel and bless you, that I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people will never be put to shame. It shall come after this, that the Holy Spirit, he said in verse 28 of Joel 2, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, on all mankind, that your sons and daughters will prophesy. There they are, Donnie. They're sitting next to you. They're going to prophesy. Some of you old guys in here, your old men are going to dream dreams. Come on. Some of you are already having dreams. Your young men shall see visions. 
and upon his servants and his handmaids. He will pour out his spirit in these days. Back then it was those days, but it's these days that God is pouring out his spirit once again. He said in verse 30, I will show signs and wonders, displaying my power in the heavens and on the earth, and blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before that great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved from the coming judgment. For the mount of, on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said, even among the remnant of survivors whom the Lord calls. Friend, we are living in those days. We are living in that day that we're reading about. We are that church. And I believe with all of my heart that you watch, and I'm just going to speak to you prophetically tonight, that today... Today is the recognized day of Pentecost. I want you to begin to listen. Listen to the news over the next several weeks. Because God's about to answer. God is about to move. We haven't seen a really strong move of God. But God is about to awaken some people up. God is about to shake some things. There's been some shaking, but there's about to be some great shaking in the earth in this hour. I want God to shake whatever needs to be shaken in my life. I want God's fire to burn up what needs to be burned up in my life. To melt away the dross. To melt away the unnecessary. That the only thing that's left is the purity of the holiness of God in my life and in your life tonight. I offer you a challenge as we get ready to pray this evening. I offer you this challenge. Are you all in? If you have to sit and contemplate about that answer, you're probably not ready tonight to be all in. If we have to debate over that, friend, after hearing about Pentecost, after hearing a message like this, I pray that the answer is yes, Pastor, I'm all in. I'm ready to give my all to the Lord. Are you willing to become consumed to the core of your being with a hunger and a desire for the Lord? Are you willing to let Him strip you of all the confidence there is in the flesh until you get to the point of total dependence upon Him? Are you willing in brokenness and humility to stand out from the crowd that is satisfied living on the stale leftover bread of yesterday? Are you willing to be emptied and then to be emptied again so that God can fully fill you with the fresh fire of His radiant glory. Would you stand to your feet tonight? Father God, I thank you right now. I thank you, God, that Pentecost is alive and well. I thank you, God, tonight that your Holy Spirit is moving in the midst of your church once again. That, God, there is a great awakening that has begun. That, God, your Spirit is being poured out even tonight upon all flesh. And, Lord, I would say that we all qualify. We all qualify for the receiving of that power and that anointing tonight. That, God, you would pour your Spirit out upon Jesus, his Lord, ministries. Father God, that it would, it would quench the fiery darts of the enemy. God, you said in your word that when Jesus returns, will he find faith in the earth? And I say, yes, he will. Because God, we are a people of faith in this place tonight. God, we believe that you will do what you said you would do. We believe, God, tonight that you have dotted every I and that you have crossed every T. And everything that you desire to do, you will do in this place tonight. Pour your spirit out Lord right now may the wind of your spirit blow in this place may it blow over our hearts over the embers of our hearts tonight God and may it cause the fire of your spirit to burn come on church let him burn in you tonight let the fire of God burn in your spirit tonight like never before I say God turn up the heat tonight God turn up the thermostat tonight God make it as, as old Nebuchadnezzar did God he made it seven times 
times hotter. But when the children of God, when those three Hebrew children went into that fire, all it did was burn off their bondage as God and brought purity. And it opened the eyes of an evil king to see the fourth man in the fire. God, you're walking in the midst of your church once again. God, you're with us in the fire that we've been going through. But God, there's another fire burning. It's not the fire of, of, of accusation. It's not the fire of persecution tonight, but it's the fire of your spirit that's burning in this place and burning in our hearts, God. Raise us up tonight, God. Brand us. Say this with me, church. Say, Lord, brand me. Brand me. Come on, cry out to him tonight. Tell him you want to be a fire brand tonight. That you want to carry the fire of God in your spirit. It's time for the church to be on fire. It's time for the church to be ablaze tonight. It's time for you, child of God, to fulfill the promise and the purpose of God in your own heart and in your own life. Don't pass the opportunity. Don't let this moment pass you by. But lay hold of those things tonight. Lay hold of what God has for you. Step into the glory tonight. The fire of God is here. And the glory of God is being revealed in the body of Christ once again. I say, Lord, show us your glory. Show us your glory, God. Reveal yourself to us. Reveal your presence to us like never before. Oh, God, open our eyes of our understanding tonight that, God, we will see what the natural eye can't see. That, God, we will begin to see into the Spirit and what your will and desire is for each one of us. For each one of us. D, would you go to the keyboard tonight and just play something something soft, whatever God puts on your heart to play. But, but tonight, church, come on. How many of you are ready to say, I'm done with normal? I'm done with the standard tonight. I want the glory of God. I want all that He has. And I'll say it to you like I said it to a church last week. If you want all of God, then give God all of you. Don't give him part of you tonight. Give him all of you. Be all in. Be all in. How many of you want to be all in? It might be a new experience. It might be new, but it's going to be great. It's going to be great. All in, Pete. You're all, you're a man 